What up, Gathering fam? So glad that you're able to tune in tonight. Welcome to the Gathering's first outdoor live stream. We're doing something different tonight. I know we can't meet in person. We won't have a live audience, but we want to do something unique and special for tonight. I know that a lot of crazy stuff has been going on over the past couple weeks. Everybody has so many things with going back to school and COVID-19 and, and the, the election cycle. And this has just been a crazy, crazy year for all of us. And it seems like it doesn't have an end in sight. But I wanted to bring a word that hopefully will bless you. And I know that many of us are, are wrestling in this season as we're anxious and we're uncertain with what things are going to be like in the future. And I think, feel like, and I think you might agree with me, that we're all in a, in a storm right now. It may look different for you than it does for me because everybody is walking through different parts of their life. But if you look at throughout the scriptures, you'll see that storms are a normal part of, of, the, of the text from Genesis through the Psalms, Proverbs, all the way through the Gospels. There are storms that come in all shapes and forms. But if you actually look in deeper, in the ancient world, storms were symbolic of trials and even more of chaos. And that's so true. When we have a storm come through our life, it, it's chaotic, it's stressful, it's anxious. And, and so many times when you're in a season and, and things just are unsettled and you're not at peace and you're just uh, un unsure about the future, it's just so chaotic and it feels like a storm in your life. As I say that, the wind is blowing and I hope that, uh, hope that my Bible stays on here uh, as, we, as I stay with you tonight. So this message over the next 20 minutes or so is titled, How to Faith. And I know it's a funny title, but uh, it's so true. Faith is a very simple concept, but it's also so misunderstood. So over the next you know, 20 minutes or so over the course of my message, I'm going to break down really what faith is and, and what true biblical faith looks like and how you can exercise faith in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, I hope that you brought your Bible. You're sitting at home, so hopefully you did. But I hope that you're coming in today and you are looking to get engaged. It's not just, you know, you watching this as though you're tuning into Netflix or just a regular YouTube channel. I hope that you are ready to get engaged. So if you have your Bible, whether you have your iPhone or, or, or tablet, or even your old school throwback paper Bible, I do encourage that you open up to Mark chapter four with me as we press in. I'm going to pray and then we'll dive into the text. Sound good? Father God, we're just excited for this afternoon for, to be able to press in and, and open up your word. Excited, Lord God, that we're here at the Forefathers Monument, Lord, a place that, that symbolizes faith. And, and that is the heart of the text we're reading today and the heart of the message. And I pray, Lord God, that as so many people are tuning in tonight who are anxious or unsettled or fearful of the future, Lord God, or, or fearful of their present situation, that you've given them a spirit of peace, Lord God. So we pray for a blessing over this word and that blessing for everybody watching tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so let's open up to the text. If you have your Bible, it's Mark chapter 4, verse 35, and we're actually going to be reading through chapter 5, verse 1. So just to set the scene, they were actually just coming down from a mountain. And at this point, um, they get into, get into the boat because they're about to cross the Sea of Galilee. And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat. So the boat was already filling, but he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. He said, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and sea obey him? And they came to the other side of the sea. So we read this text and a lot has unfolded before us and a lot can actually be missed. Many of us have read that text before. You're familiar with it. You may have read it in full in the full context of the book of Mark. But to read this text and you can easily miss some essential things which I hope to pull apart over the next few minutes. 
But first we see that they get into the boat and Jesus makes a promise to them. He says, let's get to the other side. That's not just him saying, we're going to make a plan. Let's go to the other side and see what happens. This is Jesus making a promise. He's actually saying, we're going to get to the other side. What happens between that time while we're in the ocean? You know what? It's going to happen either way. But guess what? I'm promising you we're going to get to the other side. So Jesus makes a promise in that moment. Also note that they weren't alone on this trip. There were other boats with them. You know, you see, the, the, you see this, the disciples with Jesus on their boat and then other boats around them. But sometimes we only focus on the boat that is featured here. And isn't that so true? In our lives, when we're going through a storm, when we are going through a season, we tend to only focus on our situation, not realizing that so many other people maybe are walking through the same exact thing that we are. They're in the same exact storm as Jesus and the disciples, but you can see that the focus is only on, on the main characters here. And sometimes with us, we think that we're the only ones walking through something, but the truth is so many other people have experienced the same thing. For the word says that uh, there is no temptation that is uncommon to man. And, and the truth is, is that everything that has come through life in, in, in one form or another, we've experienced, and Jesus even experienced himself. Um, so after that, we, we notice that a, a great storm comes tearing through the sea. And if you know anything about the Sea of Galilee, it's surrounded by, by mountains. And mountains are known for unpredictable weather patterns. And in the Sea of Galilee, when a storm came through, even if it was a mild storm, the winds would get so aggressive and violent, they would, they would actually get up to hurricane force winds, 70 plus miles an hour, that, will, what, that would create violent waves and crashing, uh, crashing water over the, and it could sink boats in a matter of minutes. So when this storm came in, they, had, they knew that it was, it was a life or death situation. And then what happens is we notice that they're in a frenzy, the boat's filling with water, the disciples are filling, filling with fear, but Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. He's completely passed out. He's, you know, he's sawing logs in the back of the boat on a cushion, and the storm doesn't wake him up. The disciples wake him up. They shake him. They say, Rabbi, the, the, do you not care that this boat is, is, is sinking? Do you not care that we're about to perish? And in a moment, he gets up, and with three words, he says, peace, be still, and he calms the storm. And actually, when we look at the Greek, it's the same word when he, can't, when he rebukes, he says, peace be still, that he uses to cast out or rebuke demons. So this is the same uh, text. It's, uh, it also, when it says um, that he rebuked, it actually could mean muzzled or, or removed in that moment, completely took away the chaotic uh, environment in that moment. And then it said it was calm. And in the Greek, that, that can actually, if you look even further, it actually means megacom, megacom. And you think about that, that almost seems like a modern word. But in the Greek, it was so calm that it was at an ultimate peace. There was no chaos, no panic, no disorder in that moment. Everything from the wind and the waves, the rain, everything was completely calm in that moment in time. And then he says to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Have you still no faith? That key word is still, which I'll break up in, 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 in part two, or um, in, in my second point of the message, so hold on to that. He says, have you still no faith? And he rebukes them in that moment. And then finally, in verse one of chapter five, it says, they came to the other side. So in that moment, the promise was, fulf was fulfilled. So we see in verse 35, he makes the promise, let's get to the other side. But then in chapter one of verse five, the promise was fulfilled. So even though a storm was raging for a little while, Jesus' promise that we'll get to the other side never failed. But his promises never fail. And everything that he promised us or secures in us or is written in God's word is a promise. And even if life is whipping up fiery storms that we don't expect, we know that the promises will always be fulfilled at the end. So let's bring to point number one and is the heart of, of the text today. This message is about faith. And as I mentioned before, faith is, is so commonly used in the church, in our culture, but it's often so misunderstood as well. So point number one is this, is that faith needs an object. 
we often see the word faith used so liberally. You know, you, you walk into somebody's house and they have these, these signs on their wall that just say faith. You see the lyrics to songs, uh, you just got to have faith. Uh, you have people say, oh yeah, you know, we'll plug in a little bit more. You just believe with all your heart. It just takes a little bit of faith. And those things, they sound great and they can be encouraging in a short season of time. But faith that is alone doesn't have much meaning. Honestly, when faith stands alone, it's just psychological comfort. It's just wishful thinking. And oftentimes, it doesn't have any substance behind that. So faith needs an object. And what is the object that I'm referring to in this situation? That's Jesus. Faith needs to be rooted in the life and the promises of Jesus. If you think about faith without a foundation, it's like a house without a foundation. It's like, it's like a car without a frame. It's like pizza without, without crust, and, and that ain't it. So you don't want to be living a life that is, that is rooted without a foundation. And in the same way, if we're walking out in a faith that doesn't, is not rooted in an object that's the object of Jesus, you're going to be walking in a faith that doesn't have much value, that doesn't have much support, that may sound sounds great on the surface, but the heart of it isn't secure. But faith needs an object. And the truth is that faith alone cannot save us. And you might say to yourself, wait a minute, Alex, I thought that the Bible says that we're saved by faith alone. And that's a common misunderstanding because Ephesians actually does not say that. It says we're saved by grace through faith. We're not saved by faith alone. Faith is a component of that, but truthfully, we're saved by grace through faith. So what's that grace? What does that look like? That's the work of the cross. When God sent his son to the cross to die on our behalf, that is God's grace. And that is what we're saved by. And we operate our faith through that very thing. But without that heart, without the gospel, without the cross, faith alone cannot save us. Faith alone has no substance. It doesn't have the power to heal. It doesn't have the power to cast out demons. It does not have the power to bring us through storms. It does not have the power to bring us from, from, from death to life. It, it truly can't. Faith alone is death. But the truth is that but faith that's rooted and has an object in Jesus is the faith that can bring us through the storms. I want to give you a, a, an example. You know, we think about having the idea of an object of faith because I know that this may be a difficult concept to understand, but the truth is, is that it's so simple. Think about walking on ice. Right now it's August, it's beautiful out, so we don't think about ice on ponds, but in New England we have ice all over our ponds in the middle of February. Imagine you and a friend are walking out onto a pond and uh, you have great faith that the ice is going to hold your weight. And you say, you know what? I have great faith that this ice is going to hold me. But that ice is only a quarter of the inch thick. It's very thin and you step on that ice, you're gonna fall through. But imagine then your friend goes and says, I'm gonna walk on this ice, but I'm anxious, I'm afraid, I don't have a lot of faith that this is gonna hold me. I have a little bit of faith, but it's not a high quality faith. But the ice is five, inch, five feet thick. They could drive a car on it and it won't go through. It won't matter how great or small or the quality of their faith if the object of their faith is weak. If the guy with great faith is walking on thin ice, it's not going to matter. If, the, if you with, with, with a, or, or uh, the other person with a small amount of faith is walking on thin ice or thick ice, again, that's not going to matter because it's the object of the faith that ultimately determines the end. You can be confident in this, that even if you have small faith, even if you have weak faith or flawed faith, even as small as a mustard seed, as Jesus says, that's okay because Jesus will respond if you're rooted in the object. But if you have great faith, but it's in the wrong thing, if your faith is rooted in your own strength, or maybe your faith is in the universe, or maybe your faith is in, uh, you know, just it's going to all work out, guess what? It has, it has no strength. It has no power in that. But Jesus, the name of Jesus, has the power. And faith is marked by the evidence of who Jesus is. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more in, in, in part number two. But we can be confident in this because 
Yeah, it's true. You just got to have faith, but it can't be alone. You just got to have faith in Jesus. This brings me to, to point number two. Faith needs to be exercised. The moment that Jesus calmed the storm, he rebuked the disciples. And if we look throughout the scriptures, the disciples are rebuked quite a lot. And there's various, various reasons why he rebukes them. But the number one reason why they rebuked is usually because of their faith. This rebuke that we see here is similar to the rebuke that we see in Matthew 17, where the disciples unsuccessfully attempt to cast out a demon from a boy. And Jesus comes on the scene and does it in, in just a moment and says, you know, you don't have the faith. You just need a faith of a mustard seed. And then we also see in, in, um, earlier in Matthew, Peter was called upon the waters and his lack of faith crashed him right into the sea. And it's the same thing that Jesus rebuked him for in that very moment. So Jesus is co constantly rebuking his disciples for their lack of faith or their weak faith. But what he's truly saying in this moment is that you are not exercising the faith that I have given to you. We know from Ephesians that faith is actually a gift and God has given us the gift of faith. And if we don't exercise it and we don't use it, it's not going to be something that we're able to walk through powerfully. There's a, there's a mistake that in, in, in the assumption that, that faith is an automatic thing, that it's something that we simply uh, have an impulse for. And in a moment, we just suddenly have faith. But the truth is, is that faith is something that we have to, have to consciously participate in. And God expects us to participate in that faith, not you know, just by sitting around and waiting for stuff to happen, but we have to take the action to exercise that faith. And why is this so important? You know, why is Jesus consistently rebuking the disciples for their lack of faith, for their weak, their weak faith, or their poor quality faith? Why is it, number one, their faith probably isn't uh, focused on my first part. Their faith probably isn't focused on Jesus as the object. And the second thing is that Faith is marked by the evidence of who Jesus is. Think about that for a second. We're saved by grace through faith, meaning that we are saved because of the cross. And if our faith and our life and walk with God is not rooted in the gospel, rooted in the, in the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, then everything that Jesus instructs us and teaches us to do is meaningless because we're walking in our own truth and just assuming that Jesus is our sidekick. But we cannot live our life through that. Um, and that's why Jesus says, you still have no faith? Meaning, you have seen all of the things that I've done with you. We're in Mark chapter 4 and it has been several weeks at this moment that Jesus has been with his disciples. Up until this moment, he has raised folks from the dead. He has casted out demons. He has healed lepers. He has cast out fevers and sickness from people. And not only that, but he's been preaching with authority in a way that the world had never seen before. So they had seen and experienced the evidence of what Jesus was capable of doing. They had watched and seen him under his discipleship of what he was able to do. And he says to them, listen, you have just seen me do all of these things over the past several weeks and you still have no faith. And I know it's easy for us to, to look at the disciples and say, oh, well, they're, they're such goons, they, you know, they don't know any better. They're with Jesus and they're, they're, they're acting like this. But the truth is, is if we do the same exact thing. As Christians, we know what Jesus is capable of doing. We know his miracles. We know his promises. We know his truth. We know his resurrection. We know that he is coming back and he's going to secure us in the last days. But somehow, we still forget to apply this to our lives. And that is the ultimate truth, is that faith fails when we forget Jesus has the power over a situation. And faith also fails when we doubt that Jesus has power over a situation. So you may be walking through something right now, I don't know what it is, and you may feel that Jesus isn't powerful enough to, to break through this. Jesus doesn't have the power to, to, to heal me or, or break through this anxiety or break through this relationship trouble, whatever it might be. But the truth is, Jesus does. Or you might forget. You might live your life and be so comfortable in your Christianity that you forget the reality of what Jesus has promised you. So here's the thing. Never forget his precepts. Never forget his promises. Never forget his, his benefits because God has is not absent. He didn't put you on earth, stir things around, and then check out for a bit. God is 
present in our lives and he's active in our lives and he's ready to listen to every prayer that you speak. And listen, we don't have to go to the mountains to to see God anymore. We don't have to go climb the highest peaks in order to experience the presence of God. All we have to do is open our mouths and use our voices and use our lips to speak to the, the God of all creation. And this reveals something huge that a lot of people miss, and that's this. Faith is not simply an emotion or an impulse that comes upon you. Faith is an action. It must be exercised. And it's a conscious decision that we must make in our day-to-day walk with God. Don't expect it to happen on its own. You need to have the object of faith in, in Jesus, and then you ultimately need to walk it out every single day. As I end this message and come to a conclusion, I want you to press in. I don't want you to check out in this moment. I want you to dig deeper. I want you to get your notebooks, get ready for the next section, because here's the thing. I'm going to wrap up everything in a nice package for you. When storms come rushing in, sometimes we have a habit of focusing on the external events in our lives. When the storms come in, we focus on the wind and the waves. We focus on the, 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 the rain that's coming. We focus on the ship that's sinking. And in our, our, our truth situation, is, it's not much different. When you get bad news or you get uh, you know, a diagnosis or you hear you know, you know, that your fall semester at college is not what it's going to be expected, we focus on the external elements. We focus on the what ifs. And in that moment, that's when we start to take our eyes off of Jesus and put them on everything around us. And that's one of the enemy's biggest tools and tactics is to put you in a season of chaos, and put you in a season of discomfort, and put you in a season where he takes away your, your comfort and your peace and sows in a season of anxiety. And that is not from God. We set our minds on the what ifs. And the funny part is, is that, you know, Many of us are aware of what Jesus can do. Many of us are aware of what his promises are, but we forget to apply these very things to our own lives. And just this past Saturday, I went on a hiking trip with a small group to Lincoln, New Hampshire. And we were hiking the Franconia Ridge, which if you know anything about the Franconia Ridge, it's, it's one of the most challenging and strenuous hikes in New England. It's very long, it's a lot of elevation gain, and the, the weather, is much like the Sea of Galilee, where in a moment, a storm can come unexpectedly. The day that we went out, there was a 7% chance of rain. So the odds were greatly in our favor that we were gonna have a beautiful day of sunshine. But when we hiked to the top of Little Haystack, which Little Haystack is the first mountain on the the peak, uh, on the ridge, we noticed that a rainstorm was starting to come in. And we have a, a, have a photo that we wanna throw up on the screen so you can see this rainstorm coming through. Um, And we could see it from a distance. It was very dark and gray. And we said, you know what? It will probably come through and pass, but we don't know what it's gonna bring. So we hunkered down for a little bit. And at 4,800 feet, we started to hear and feel the rain coming all over us. And the temperature dropped dramatically. And it went from being about 55 to 60 degrees to being in the high 30s. And the wind was gusting through. It was raining. And we started to get soaking wet. And that's when the what ifs kicked in. You know, what if we can't get down from the mountain? What if somebody falls and gets hurt? What if somebody gets hyperthermia? Because we were cold, we were wet, and we were in really, you know, we were on top of a mountain. We had just hiked almost four hours to get to the top, and we were at the, we were above tree line. It was, we were very exposed in that situation. So the what is kicked in, but we got together as a group, and we said, you know what? God has a, God has a much more power and authority over the weather than, than we do. So in that moment, we prayed. And we sought God and we said, you know what, God, this is your will to end the rain. This is your will to to take away and dry this place up. This is your will to to clear this storm. And within a few moments, the rain stopped. And I remember running to the top of the summit at that moment because we were down a little bit away from the wind, running up and seeing blue sky that the sun had been piercing through. And there's another image that I want to show you just to show you what it looked like once I peeked my head over that summit. The skies were blue. And at that moment, I knew that God was showing us a promise that he had fulfilled in that moment. And although that's a small story, it's, and it's in that moment, it was easy for us to simply say, oh, it's you know just a storm. It's a little thing for God to do. 
God wants us to seek Him in all of our, our, all of our situations. Even if it's as small as finding a parking spot or as big as curing cancer, God wants you to seek Him in that situation. And then from that moment on, the sky was beautiful for the rest of the day. And we could look on. We had two more summits to go. Every summit that we looked at had clouds all over the top of it. They were completely clouded in. But in both situations, by the time we climbed to the top of that summit, it was completely clear. So God was waiting for us in that moment to clear the, clear the summits in every moment. And that's so true. God may let a storm rage in your life a little bit. God may let uh, these seasons extend a little bit longer than you want, but he's doing it for a reason. It's in these seasons that we grow stronger. It's in these seasons that our faith is developed. And it's in those seasons that we're stretched. And God will never let these seasons go to waste. And although we can't see the outcome or the purpose, God is something great. But I know this, storms are never easy. And storms will bring chaos, they'll bring anxiety, they'll bring uncertainty. But in these storms, God wants us to trust in Him, to trust in Jesus, the object of our faith, and exercise our faith through that, through prayer, through trusting in His promises, through understanding that God is going to do way more than we could ever imagine because what's impossible with man is more than possible with God. And in that moment, you have to stop focusing on the what ifs and focusing on the who can and God can. There's a, a verse from a, a song that was just released by Maverick City Music called Promises. And the, there's a verse that says, Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn, when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. And isn't that so true? Even though the storms may come, even though we may be uncertain, maybe we don't know where our feet stand, God is faithful. And when He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, that isn't just an empty promise. That is a, that is a secured promise that's in heaven and eternal for you. Tim Keller has a quote. He says, Jesus claimed, or Jesus calmed the only storm that could really sink us, the storm of God's justice and wrath and by dying on the cross so that we could be saved. If we see him doing that, then we will be able to trust him in all the other smaller storms that come upon us. It's so true, isn't it? The biggest storm was God's wrath. The biggest storm was the, the, that started in the, the Garden of Eden when, when, when man sinned and, and ushered in a, a curse on humanity, but that was the biggest storm, but Jesus paid for it on the cross. And if we can set our eyes on that, then all the other small storms that come in our life are just, are just minor compared to that. And even if storms rage for a while, we can be confident in the words that God tells us, and that's, I will never leave you or forsake you. So I wanna leave you today and I wanna pray for you knowing that God has you in this season for a reason. And you may not know what it is or what it looks like, but I want you to trust in Him. I want you to press in. I want you to use this season to be developed and shaped and transformed from the inside out. And never forget that Jesus is the object of our faith. And never forget that we need to be exercising our faith every single day. Lord God, I thank you for those who have tuned in today. Thank you for those who have been uh, inspired by the word. And I pray that those who are wrestling through this season, those who are feeling anxious or feeling uh, you know, fearful or fear, feeling like this season is, um, is this season is, you know, bringing them into a place of darkness or isolation. I pray, Lord God, that you give them peace, that you give them comfort, that you give them wisdom, and that you give them the ability and the strength to have faith through this season, Lord. So we thank you, Lord God, in all of our situations, from the highs and the lows, from the peaks and the valleys, we thank you, Lord God, knowing that you are going to bring us through it all, and because you have so many promises in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I hope that you have a blessed evening.